Wow. Let me share just two or three things with you before we share the message for Bible st- or well, men's prayer meeting uh, Monday night and then Bible study Wednesday night and uh, May the 1st is uh, our uh, Fellowship Sunday and uh, Cook's Choice on that, so keep that in mind. And, uh, well, it's hard to believe we're pushing into May, you know. So yes, Pastor. You, you can look at the bullets and then keep in mind all the different things that Pastor. are going to be taken. Pastor? Hmm? Back here. Huh? Back here. I'm just going to say, those who didn't make it Wednesday night, they missed a very good inspirational movie. Uh, amen. Amen, it was. And uh, kind of a, a surprise ending. And, and uh, uh, I think some of us talked about that and, and uh, was debating whether the little girl was an angel or not. And, uh, uh, but uh, it, it, it didn't have the Hallmark uh, uh, type ending. It, it was kind of, uh, but it was a great movie, so. Amen. Well, praise God. Well, this morning, uh, the theme is the promise of the Spirit. And, uh, uh, of course, uh, we'll be leading up to uh, uh, Pentecost Sunday and uh, uh, talking about the the Holy Spirit and uh, how the Holy Spirit can work in our lives and through our lives and... and, uh, you know, uh, what I want to do, uh, and you can turn your Bible to uh, John, the 14th chapter. John, the 14th chapter. And while you're turning there, I, I, I want to uh, talk about uh, just a minute that, uh, uh, to ask two questions. And I want you to ponder the two questions and uh, think about them as I share uh, uh, the message with you and uh, you know uh, and even in this passage of scripture we're going to uh, share and look through the, uh, most of the 14th chapter of John uh, but uh, uh, there's two questions the first one are you ready for the first one the first question is is how you would rate yourself as a Christian and when I'm talking about that uh, uh, that is, are we good enough for God to, to be happy with us? Uh, you know, are, are we uh, good enough that God would listen to our prayers? Uh, or basically, how would you rate yourself as a Christian? And uh, uh, I want you to ponder that. Uh, you know, maybe you've never thought about that. But the second one is, it has to do with how we know what is right in our lives. How do we know to make the right decision? How do we know the, uh, the, that we're doing the right thing and uh, decide what to, to do or say at, at one moment or another? And uh, those are important questions. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, you evaluate that and... and uh, you listen uh, to this passage of scripture. I want to uh, start uh, at the ninth verse of John 14. And uh, uh, we're going to read uh, all the way through to the end of that passage. It's, it's a long uh, passage, uh, but uh, I want you to listen to it. And it, all, it deals with the, uh, the Holy Spirit and uh, how it can work in our lives. Uh, starting with verse 9, it says, Jesus said to them, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the work. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe for the sake of the works themselves. Most surely I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, 
and greater works than these will he do because I go to the Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. That's pretty powerful statements, isn't it? And listen to what he says in verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. He's not telling you to keep the commandments, but he's telling you if you really love me, if you really love me, then the automatic response should be that you'll keep his commandments. Okay? And uh, so keep that in mind. It's an important factor. Verse 16, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you for how long? Forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And a little while longer, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live, you will live also. And that day you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. I me realize that's a challenging passage of Scripture. The interchanging and the interrelationship that the Holy Spirit gives us with the Heavenly Father and with Jesus and and the Holy Spirit working in us. It says, He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Pretty important passage of Scripture. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus answered and said to them, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Have you noticed a factor that love is a pretty important factor in this thing, along with the Holy Spirit? It says in 24, He who does not love me does not keep my word. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while being present with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring uh, to your remembrance all the things that I said to you. Peace I live with, leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to, to you. Let not your hearts be troubled. Let it not be afraid. You have heard me say to you, I am going away and coming uh, uh, back to you. Now, that's an important phrase too because he said, I'm going away, but I'm coming back to you. And uh, so keep that in mind. And uh, 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 And now I have told you before it comes that when it does come, to pass, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming, and he has nothing in me. But that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father uh, gave me commandments, so I do. Arise, let us go from here. And as I share this message, and this will be the introduction of the series of messages that we will share uh, uh, as we uh, approach uh, Pentecost Sunday. But in the first part of John, the 14th chapter, which I didn't read, uh, he tells the disciples, let not your hearts be troubled. You know, if you believe in God, believe also in me. And I'm going to weigh it to prepare a place for you. And if I'm going to weigh to prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you that where I am, you may be, you may be also. But can you imagine if you think about the disciples a moment? They lived with him, they traveled with him, 
They slept with him. They dined with him. Everything that they did in them three years of his ministry, they did together. And now all of a sudden, he's saying, hey, I'm going away. How many of you believe your hearts would be troubled? And how many of you realize that it, it, it put those disciples, well, I can explain to you, uh, maybe in a couple phrases, they were afraid. They were hiding. They were meeting in secret places because they didn't know what to do. They lost the very person that they put all their trust in, the person who they loved, and the person who, as long as they walked with him, they saw miracles, and they saw God do unbelievable things. But now in, th in that meeting, he says, I'm going to leave you, but I'm not going to leave you forever. I'm coming back. And then he talks about the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit is going to come and represent him as he lives in your lives. So I want you to think about all of those things. Those are important elements. But when you look at John and uh, you realize in that, uh, let me see which verse it was again, I forgot. In that 15th chapter, he says, or 15th verse in the 14th chapter, he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Now, I want you to think about that because when you read in Matthew, the 22nd chapter, verse 37 through 40, listen to what it says about love. Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God on Sunday mornings. <laughs> Shucks, I, I, I must have misprinted that one. Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first com great commandment. And the second one is, you'll play dirty tricks on your neighbor. You'll throw your junk over the yard, over the fence, so they can clean it up. No, I didn't say that either, did it? It says, the second one is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, I'm going to come back and, and say something. You'll love your neighbor as you love yourself. And if you don't have much love for yourself, if you don't have much respect for yourself, if you don't have much respect for life, if you've never experienced the love of Christ and the love of Christ that lives within you, that transforms your life and makes you love even your enemies, that makes you go the extra mile to touch people's lives, the love of God in you that will change your whole personality and, and everything about you, you may do bad things. But the love of God that he's talking about and obeying the commandment it, it, it is that simple commandment, to love God and to love your neighbor, love people. In John, the 13th chapter, verse 34 and 35, listen to what it says. A new commandment, and we're, these are all New Testament things, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Now, how many realize that's quite a challenge, that we need to love one another as he has loved us? Are we in a passing grade if we look at Christianity? You know, I mean, uh, it's one thing uh, uh, to... Uh, get mad over something outside of the church, but we get mad inside the church. You know, and, uh, you know, we want people to come and be a part of us, and, you know, the rumor gets out, boy, you got to watch that Gerald Wright, he has a temper, you know. Or, you know, you got to watch Rita, she'll polish your ears while you're sitting here in church. <laughs> but I want you to think about these elements that, you know, if you love me, the re out of the response of that love, you'll want to do the commandments. You'll want to 
follow in his leadership. You want to be an example that people can see uh, Jesus in you. And, you know, here's an interesting passage of Scripture. In Romans chapter 5 and, and verse 5, listen to this passage of Scripture. It says, now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So, I mean, here's a combination. He says, I want you to obey the commandment. The commandment is a new one that we love one another as he's loved us. Uh, the commandment, uh, the first one was old and new, that you love the Lord with all your heart, with all your ability. Everything about you should be in love with the Lord Jesus Christ and the Heavenly Father. How, can I hear an amen out of that? You know, and that love ought to uh, increase within you that you fall more and more in love with him. And uh, so he says, here, I'm giving you a little help. I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm going to send a helper. And that helper is the Holy Spirit that represents. And what's interesting, uh, I was going to do it this week, and, and I didn't get far enough along in my slides. And, and, uh, uh, but uh, uh, there uh, in the, uh, the church in the early beginnings, they uh, would explain uh, the Trinity, and they would call it the Holy Dance. And they would say that, that God the Father and God the Son and God the Spirit would twirl and, and they would twirl in such speed that you could see actually three forms in there, but they all blended together as one. I thought that was a pretty heavy analogy. How many realize that as Christians, and as we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and we accept him as our Lord and Savior. And he places the Holy Spirit inside of us. And it says the Holy Spirit, he pours this love in us. And this love should be the manifestation of how we live our lives. And how we conduct uh, what we do in the church and in the community and in all these different areas. And out of that, people ought to see Jesus in us. And if you listen to the passage of Scripture, it's an interesting case. Guess what? It says, if you love me, God the Father will come and live with you. If you love me, Jesus will come and live with you. If you love me, the Holy Spirit is going to come in and dwell in you. And then guess what? You're the fourth thing in that. And God is interweaving you together that people can see Jesus in you. And you know, uh, I, I think that uh, staggers my mind that to think that all of that lives inside of me as I develop this love. And as I uh, allow the Holy Spirit. And uh, you know, uh, one translation says the, uh, the advocate. Uh, another translation says the helper. I made my own translation, the champion supporter. <laughs> How many of you believe the Holy Ghost is the champion supporter? That he comes to su support you and to help you and to guide you and uh, to uh, cause Jesus to come alive inside of you. And, uh, you know, I want you to think about it. Uh, those disciples, how many of you agree they needed help? And can you imagine... When we get to Pentecost Sunday, man, I'd have loved to have been there. Can you imagine they gathered there in that upper room, and all of a sudden, they could hear this sound, and they could hear the wind of the Holy Ghost, and that thing began to fill that meeting where they was at. And I mean, God literally began to empower their lives. They changed from people of fear and defeat and discouragement to people of power that stood up and boldly began to, to share what God had done in their lives. Well, the church needs a wake-up call, guys. Uh, we need the, the outpouring of this Holy Spirit. We need that love poured in our hearts, and it begins to flow through our lives and, and changes the way we act and the way we talk and, and the, the, the way we live. And can you imagine 
uh, you know, Peter. Any, you, you remember any negative things about Peter? You know, Peter uh, was an outspoken person. And, you know, and he says, I'll never deny you. And did he mess up on that one? Yeah, he did. And, uh, uh, you know, but when the Holy Spirit came up on Peter, he stood up and preached with great boldness. And what was the number of people that got saved? Anybody remember? Hmm? Three. Three thousand. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's 3,000 men, not counting all the other people that was around, around there. How many realize, wouldn't that have been exciting to, to be there? You know, and, and there was so not much noise made that the crowds began to, to push in to, to uh, find out uh, what was going on. And uh, what, a, what a, an experience that was. Now, when we think about the Holy Spirit... And we're going to go through a, a lot about the Holy Spirit. How many believe he's there, he, he's here to help us? How many believe that? How many believe that, that uh, uh, you can ask him? How many believe you can talk to him? How many believe that you can open your heart up and, and, and say, man, I've got this problem? And be honest with him because he's there to help you. He's there, you know, to guide you. He's there to support you. He's there to open your understanding to the Word of God. You know, uh, uh, I told Carolyn this week, I was doing some research, and it was just like, man, all of a sudden, I'd read that passage of Scripture, I don't know how many different times, and it was just like a light bulb come on. Have you ever had that experience? And, and, and it just illuminates you, uh, in, in you, and you realize, ooh, that's, that's a powerful truth. I, I need to grab a hold of that and, and allow that to work uh, in my life. You know, and can you imagine, and this is the one that I like, that when he comes into your life, he comes in to give you power. He gives you strength. Bible actually says the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead will dwell in you. That's resurrection power. How many believe that's power that can transform your life? That makes you a new creation, a different person than you've ever been. Give you boldness that, that, that like you've never experienced in your life. You know, I'm getting ready to do Kathy Harris's funeral on Wednesday. And Kenny and Kathy, uh, actually, uh, it's amazing how I met Kenny and Kathy Harris. Kenny's dad had died. And Cliff Harrell and I, of course, were been together for years. Cliff knew Kenny, and, and he said, Gerald, he said, that family needs help. And so I went out, and I met Kenny's mother, fell in love with Kenny's mother. She was... She, uh, she's in uh, assisted living. And I met her three sons, and her, uh, Kenny's mother said, I'll introduce you to my three sons, and I'm just going to be up front. They're pretty rotten. <laughs> they're just, they're just kind of a mess. And, uh, uh, but anyway, in that, Kenny and Kathy visited Spirit of Life Church. And they were tough. They were hard. They'd lived life to its fullest in the world. And Kathy, she gave her heart to Christ. Guys, if you could have seen Kathy before and Kathy after she received Christ, and God's Spirit came into her. I'm telling you, she was the hardest worker and she loved to work for Jesus. She loved kids. She had been raised in some really hard areas. And she had got saved. She marched into those areas. And she started to bring in kids. And she started helping those kids. And uh, she drove the, she got her bus license. She drove the bus at church. She, she did everything. And it was a miraculous miracle that the power of God literally transformed her life and transformed Kenny's life. And then his brother Jack came along. 
And I thought Jack, I thought Kenny was bad. Jack was a mess. And God touched Jack, and he got saved. And then George came along. And George gave his heart to, to Jesus. And George happened to be married to, to, I guess she was my second cousin. And Lynn gave her heart to Jesus. Isn't that pretty neat? And, and, and that's a God thing. It's simply God taking his spirit and pouring it into your life, making you a new creation and giving you the ability to love beyond your ability, and giving you the ability to, to care and reach out and touch people's lives. And not only that, the boldness. Acts 1.8 says, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, it gives you what? Power. Power to be a witness. Power to be a representative. To tell the story of what Jesus has done in your life. And, and Kathy and Kenny were the prime example of that. And, you know, I was always amazed at, at, at Kathy because uh, uh, when Kathy, before she got saved, she had a temper that would put the fear in most people. And uh, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll give you one example. Kenny was not acting like he ought to be acting. And she told him, she said, you better straighten up. And he told her what he thought. And she grabbed a ball bat and tuck after him. And he was smart enough to know that when she had that ball bat and she was after him, he better run for everything he was worth. And he ran and jumped into his truck and locked the door. And she was standing outside and she just wound up and knocked the windshield right out of that truck. <laughs> and knock the side glass out and come right in after him. How would you like her to be the bus driver for your church? <laughs> but you know, isn't it easy? God literally, when the Holy Spirit, the power and the love of the Spirit of God came in her, it transformed her life. It made her a new creation and instead of having an anger and a temper that would totally get out of control, love began to flow out of her. How many believe we need to tap into that and experience some of that, that love and allow God to, to do things? Now think about this. Let's see if this is not a challenge here. And go back to John, the, the 14th chapter. And this look at verse 12. It says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me believes in Jesus. All right? It says, Who believes in me, the works that I will do, he will do also. And greater works than these will he do because I go to my Father. I mean, what a challenging verse. But it says, If you believe in me, if you love me, if you believe in the, the Holy Spirit coming into your life as a helper, if you believe that it's there to give you strength, if you believe it's there to fill you to overflowing with love, if you believe all of those ingredients, I'm going to send you out into the world, and guess what? You're going to do even greater things. What was happening, it started with 12 disciples. And if you read through the... New Testament, it went from 12 to 70 to 120 to 3,000 to 5,000 to people who were believing this message and receiving the power of the Holy Spirit. And it began to spread and it began to grow and people's lives were being transformed. Philip, a deacon, Philip who had got touched by the power of God, went into Samaria, preached the message, and that whole city turned to the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that pretty exciting? And yet it was the working and the power of the Holy Spirit as the disciples and the followers of Jesus fell more and more in love with the Lord. And God began to work so powerfully in their lives. Can I hear an amen out of that? And don't you think it's interesting what, you know, God can do? Now, here's the thing, and I'll close with this thought. 
When you read John 14, he says, if you love me, the Father is going to live in Rita. If you love me, the Son is going to live in Rita. If you love me, the Holy Spirit is going to live in her. And what God's going to do is take those three and intertwine them in Rita's life. And as he does that, it changes your life. Can you imagine being knitted together like that? And that you have the Father, you have the Son, and you have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of you. And you know what he wants to happen? He wants that so, to so change you on the inside that it begins to flow out of you and that people begin to see that and say, wow, look what God's done in that lady's life. Look what God's done in Carolyn's life. Look what God's done in Jeff's life. And look how it's transformed. How many believe we need a wake-up call for the Holy Spirit? to work in our lives and, and give us this uh, ability. You know, and here's the interesting thing. I, I, I do want to say this. I was, going to I was going to close, but I want to say one other thing. It says the Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. In other words, the Holy Spirit will cause the Word of God to come alive. It will cause the Word of God to be revelation knowledge to you, that he will reveal his word. And you know what? It's a simple principle. Faith comes by what? And hearing what? The word of God. And the Holy Spirit is guiding you into these truths. And the Holy Spirit is opening your understanding and enlarging your ability to receive the the truth of God. And when that truth comes alive in you and that faith to say, wow, I can believe that. I can, I can, I, I believe I can step out on that. It's like when Jesus was walking on the water, he said, step out of the boat. How I many you realize that took a little bit of faith, huh? Yeah. Took a, you know, and you know, what happened when he got his eyes on the wrong thing? He started going under. Instead of looking at Jesus, instead of keeping his eyes on, on the living word, he looked at the storm. Have we ever been guilty of looking at the storm? We have, haven't we? We've looked at the wrong elements. And when we look at the wrong elements, we start to sink. We start to falter. But what God wants us to do is allow the Holy Spirit to guide us into the truth. Allow the Holy Spirit to reveal the truth to us. Allow the Holy Spirit to give us the boldness to voice the truths that we experience within our lives. And you know, here is an interesting thing. And we'll pick all this up. The Holy Spirit also is a convictor. Have you ever done something dumb? <laughs> yeah, I, 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 that was my point. I hate that when I do it more than once. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, you know, it's just, uh, it, it's really dumb. I always, uh, it, it, it wasn't funny at the time, but it's been funny to me ever since. Fred Starkweather, he was a perfect, he is a perfectionist. And, uh, uh you just asked Carolyn. Carolyn worked for Fred when we first got married, and he was her boss. And uh, uh, we wasn't friends at that time, and, and she'd come home, and that's the meanest man you ever, you know. But anyway, Fred gave his heart to Christ, and, and we were in a building project, and Fred wouldn't let anybody go to the work until he made sure he'd give them a safety talk and got everybody lined up, and he had a drill in his hand. And he had a piece of wood. And he held the drill up and the piece of wood with his hand and, and held it like this. And he said, don't ever do this. And he turned that drill on and it shot right through that wood and right through that hand, come right out the top. 
And I, I'm standing there thinking, did I just see that? <laughs> and, and, and everybody was shocked. Well, then I had to grab Fred up, and we had to run to the emergency room. And the only thing Fred told me on the way to the emergency room, he said, you keep your mouth shut. <laughs> He said, don't you breathe one word. <laughs> I told everybody I saw. <laughs> but you know, here's the neat thing about that. When we make mistakes, he brings conviction. And he begins to speak to your heart. You're going in the wrong direction. You're doing the wrong thing. How many of you believe he does that? And he'll keep working at you to bring you back in the journey that he wants you to walk, in the way that he wants you to walk. But you have to be, trust him to do that. And you know, I, everybody, you know, through the years, I've always had people say, how do you know you're saved? Well, I'm going to tell you what, how do you know when you're not saved if you profess to be a Christian and God never brings conviction into your life? You never get convicted for doing things and acting th ways you shouldn't. You probably need to go back to the cross. Because I think one of the sure things in your life, if the Spirit of God lives in you, you're going to do some mistakes. There's only one perfect person that lived on this earth, and that was Jesus. But conviction is a real thing. And when you make mistakes, God will bring conviction. He'll make you miserable. He'll convict you and, 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 and to the point that you want to cry out for forgiveness. And 1 John 1, 9 says, if I confess my sins, he's what? Faithful and just to forgive me. Amen? Let's stand together. As you stand with me, I want you to just bow your heads a moment. Close your eyes. And as you do that, let God softly speak to your heart. You may, this morning, need to ask him to rekindle the fire of God's Holy Spirit in you. You may need to ask him to forgive you of your mistakes. Ask him to create an awakening within your lives. Ask him to help you each day to trust in him, to trust that he'll guide you, trust that he'll speak to your hearts, trust that as you spend time in prayer, as you read the word, that he'll cause it to come alive in you. Let's pray together. And as we go through this journey, let's believe that at the end of this journey, God has kindled a fresh fire of the Holy Spirit within our hearts and our lives. Father, thank you for your promises. Thank you for the promise of the Holy Spirit. Father, thank you for the love of Jesus and his willingness to make a way and Father, I pray that you'll stir a hope and a faith within us that we can put our trust in you, that we can acknowledge you in our areas of life, and that we can trust you to speak to us through your word, to speak to us through a, a, another Christian, a friend, a neighbor, but give us the ability to be sensitive, that we can hear your voice, that we can hear you guiding us and directing our steps, Father God. And I pray, Father God, that for our church, that, Father, as we go through this journey about the Holy Spirit, that you'll pour your Spirit out upon our church, Father God, and that you'll give us that boldness and that love to reach out to beyond the walls of this building. And that, Father, you'll use us in special ways. And I just thank you for it. And I give you praise because you alone are worthy 
to receive it. And thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. And